Zeller 5 war damit auf der, nicht mehr auf der Bühne. So, jetzt aber. Hello everybody and thank you for coming to the Turing Exhibitions Showcase. We have uh, 14 fantastic exhibitions and each presenter will have four minutes. I just want to start by thanking TO and Museum's partner for their support for this particular session. Without them, we wouldn't know about these wonderful exhibitions that you're about to hear about, so thank you to them. Uh, there will be a recording of this on YouTube, so if you're not able to take down all the notes that you want about the exhibitions, you can find it on YouTube after the conference. Um, and I just also want to give a very big thank you to Victor, who has been amazing in organizing this. It takes quite a lot to get everybody in the right place and doing the right thing. Um, so thank you to Victor. And I would also like to say a thank you to the, to the supporting tech team. Um, so we shall start with Henna Bati from um, the Science Museum in the UK. Henna. Hello, hi everybody. My name is Henna. I am from the Science Museum Group. And today it's my pleasure to talk about our latest touring exhibition, Turn It Up, The Power of Music. So before I talk about the exhibition, I just wanted to give a little introduction to the Science Museum Group. We are a group of five museums spread across the UK, including Science Museum London, Science and Industry Museum Manchester, Science and Media Museum Bradford, the Railway Museum in York, and Locomotion in Shildon, which is in the north of England. Um, and today's exhibition is actually being developed by our site in Manchester. So turn it up, the power of music. This will be an immersive, hands-on exhibition all about the science behind music's power over us, the way it makes us feel, the things it makes us do. And it will be a mixture of objects, musical commissions, interactive experiences, showing how technology is pushing the boundaries and making music more accessible for people. The exhibition is divided into two structures, so into two um, sections, sorry. So the first section is Music Making Mind, which is all about humans' innate desire to create music. And then the second section is Mind Altering Music, which is all about science, science decoding our relationship with music. In terms of visitor experience, visitors will be immersed in moving stories about people's relationships with music and musical experiences. They will hear from musicians and makers who have built incredible instruments. They will discover the role of technology and they will explore the ways that music's power over us is being harnessed in many new ways across our everyday life. There will be a number of engaging interactives. So some of the interactives will include, um, we have an AI song judge, which is where we ask our visitors to judge whether a song is made by AI or by humans. We will have a world music quiz, which is where we see universal reactions to music or how universal these reactions are. And we'll also have um, dance along where we invite visitors to dance to pop music and a whole number of other interactors as well. And in terms of objects, so these are some of our key objects here. So just to highlight, we have a fire organ which um, plays music by propelling flames into, um, channeled into metal pipes. And then we also have the world famous Mimu gloves, which is the world's most accessible wearable instrument. And it's worn by celebrities like Ariana Grande and some other pop stars. So by the end of the exhibition, visitors will be able to understand more about the way that music affects our bodies and minds, understand more about the science behind this, and just be inspired. They will be inspired by lots of musical experiences that may trigger memories and emotions, and they'll understand how music affects all of us and affects lots of different people to them as well. 
So these are the key facts of the exhibition. Um, it's available to tour from summer 2023. And in terms of the space requirement, it's 500 meters squared. And it's a family-friendly exhibition for families, children age 5 plus. And yeah, that is it for me. So if you have any more questions or would like to talk about this, please visit us at our booth. We are booth number 33, or you can contact us about anything else on the email above here as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Henna. And next we have Joy Latour uh, from uh, the Musée d'Histoire Naturelle de Toulouse. Thank you, Joy. Hi everyone, I am glad to introduce you to our latest exhibition, Impact Biodiversity at Stake. Like many museums around the world, the Natural History Museum of Toulouse has decided to commit itself to raising awareness about the protection of biodiversity and ecosystem. The exhibition is a versatile 200 to 450 square meters and it will be available in spring 2023. A story of biodiversity. Here's a walkthrough of the project that will be divided into three different worlds. Yesterday's world with the incredible journey from the origin of life um, to mass extinctions and the appearance of man. Then today's world with the overexploitation of natural resources and lifestyles leading to the current biodiversity crisis. And finally, tomorrow's world with conservation, actions and hope. So why should you host Impact? Because uh, we will have original natural history collections with 26 specimens, uh, also uh, casts that uh, will be touchable by the public. Um, some are from the collection of uh, the Toulouse Natural History Museum. We also opened the opportunity uh, for the venue to integrate local collections. In terms of interactivity, uh, we will have an immersive projection room multimedia games, AV stations, of course, hands-on experience, and digital interactives. We also worked with um, an artist, an origami artist, and uh, we wanted to show extinct species. So she worked on a very large origami sculptures uh, that will be presented in the exhibition. We also worked with um, a photographer who is also a biologist, and we will uh, show um, in the exhibition very large prints of uh, wonderful photographs from Mathieu Pujol. So the exhibition is not ready yet. Uh, as I mentioned, it will be um, available in spring 2023 with a first stop before that at the Natural History Museum of Luxembourg. So um, I can't show you pictures yet soon. With this new project, the Natural History Museum of Toulouse has taken a big step forward by committing to a sustainable uh, development strategy. The entire exhibition, as well as the crates, are made of recycled wood um, that we bought from a previous exhibition. We also anticipated uh, the life plan planning with a recycling, reusing and offsetting strategy. So here's our catalog. If you want to learn more about our exhibition, we are currently touring seven exhibitions worldwide. Uh, you can contact me or come and say hi on our booth. We are booth number five. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joy. That was very good. Uh, and now we have Mafalda, uh, Mafalda Frade from Ciencia Viva in Portugal. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with you to talk about our new exhibition, Water, an unfiltered exhibition. For all of you here, including me, turning the tap on to get drinking water is a very simple act. But for more than two billion people around the world, it's just an impossible wish, but it can come true. The water exhibition is about the topic access to water, not only to create awareness, but also to engage and challenge us to turn the tides, to take action and make a commitment ourselves to a future with water for all. 29 exhibits explore the contrast between the life with and without access to water in the touching and always positive way. 
This exhibition gives voice to the basic right to clean water with the help of science, technology, and the commitment of all. In this exhibition, we can take a shower, an efficient one, walk for water in the desert, understand why water is also a weapon, turn into a cactus or a camel, why not? Or be surprised how astronauts sweat become a delicious coffee. Why should you have this exhibition in your museums or science center? Because it will challenge your visitors, help families to understand, reach schools and educators and change the po their point of view. Start the conversation and put your institution at the center of this fundamental debate. We may be the problem, but we are also the solution. A future with water depends on each of us. And now let me share with you just a small video. Is it working? Sound? If you need more information, we are in next here in our booth number 39. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mafalda. And now um, I'd like to welcome Peter Elasana from, uh, from Museums Partner uh, to come and speak to us about Angkor. Hi, Peter. The stage is yours. Hello, my name is uh, Peter Elsesser. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lissy. Thank you very much uh, for managing uh, this forum. Very well done, as usual. Thank you very much. Uh, I represent Museums Partner, um, a company based in Austria. I'm here together with my colleague uh, Marie Eckert. She's over there. Uh, she is handling the exhibition management from Museums Partners uh, in Austria. Um, we are a producing company, so we are producing traveling exhibitions um, and tour traveling exhibitions. But uh, what we also do, uh, and maybe this is uh, less known, uh, we are a transport company as well. So we are quite well known for museums transport all over Europe, uh, worldwide. Um, so we handle shipments. Um, we are a member of the ISAFET, the International Confederation of Fine Art Shippers and Exhibition Shippers, with about 80 member companies around the world. So uh, please feel free if you need transport expertise for one of your traveling exhibitions to reach out to us. We are also able uh, to help you with transport and logistics. The unique selling point on our exhibitions uh, is all our exhibitions are equipped with original artifacts and uh, up there is our current portfolio of exhibitions uh, which are traveling at the moment. Um, we have some breaking news for you because what's new in traveling exhibitions from our side uh, I would like to announce that uh, we are just in the process uh, to uh, arrange a cooperation with the Musée de Civilisation in Quebec City in Canada 
uh, to tour the newest exhibition of the museum. It's called Oh Shit, <laughs> believe me, it's true. Um, so we are ha very happy uh, to take on this uh, tour uh, of Oh Shit <laughs> in Europe. Uh, the exhibition will be available for three slots in Europe only uh, from fall 2024 through summer 2026. Uh, I have no slides for this uh, because that's a brand uh, new information. Uh, we are also in the process to produce an exhibition about Celts, uh, Iron Age in Europe. Uh, that's a brand new project as well. This will come up uh, in summer 2024. Uh, but uh, now to our current portfolio, uh, which we are touring in Europe, uh, the brand new exhibition or the two brand new exhibitions on these portfolios are Angkor, the Lost Empire of Cambodia, a cooperation project with the National Museum of Cambodia. Uh, it's equipped with uh, around 120 original artifacts, a very interactive science exhibition, uh, currently on display at the California Science Center in the United States in Los Angeles. Um, the exhibition um, will tour till 2026 throughout museums in North America, USA and Canada. Uh, the tour is uh, very, very fully booked or we have solid bookings there. There is only one slot which is uh, still pending um, and uh, I think that's um, sometimes fall 24, spring 25. But this is for North American audience only because we want to avoid, even if we are a shipping company, but we want to avoid shipping <laughs> because of the cost and uh, the, the current delays in, in, in shipments. Uh, here are some pictures of the exhibition. You can see it's uh, very interactive, uh, loaded with hands-on, uh, very popular, fresh topic. The second exhibition I would like to introduce um, is Orcas, Our Shared Future. That's a real science exhibition about orcas, a collaboration project with the Royal British Columbia Museum in uh, Victoria on Vancouver Island. Uh, my time is, I think, running out. I'm very sorry, <laughs> so I will speed up. Uh, orcas uh, is uh, also currently touring in the United States. Um, and uh, will be available for Europe, uh, I would say, in 24, 25. Uh, there is one urgent announcement slot. We had some COVID-related uh, postponement. We have a free slot this autumn. So if somebody is interested, uh, so this uh, exhibition could be uh, hosted for a very uh, good budget. Uh, here are some pictures from the exhibition with life-size life models and uh, loaded with interactives again. Um, here are our contact details. Uh, please visit us at our booth number 24, grab a brochure and some gifts, and we are happy to talk projects further. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Peter. That's very interesting. Okay, and now I'd like to welcome Noah Heim from the Collective Paper Aesthetics in the Netherlands. Good afternoon. My name is Noah, and I'm the founder and creative director of Collective Paper Aesthetics. The studio designs and develops audience engagement materials and STEM education resources in a scale of pop-up architecture. Early summer 2020, I was asked by Valérie Toll, the head of public services in Moudam, Luxembourg, to design custom-made educational materials to communicate with children and families the work of the artist Charlotte Posenske in a playful manner. Borrowing the heart shape from a stool my studio designed for the same museum a decade ago to accompany the exhibition Never for Money, Always for Love, curated by Anna Lopo Caro, and fusing it together with cubes, which are repetitive elements in series D or DW in Charlotte Posanske work, a new cardboard construction system from collective paper aesthetics envisioned. 
To ensure the creation of steady open-end system, the cardboard engineer and I are looking at first for how many shapes are needed to close a circle. And how and where one circle is interlocking with another one to form a sphere. In Mudamgo, four interlocking circles will form a pop-up space size three meter on three meter. That's okay. Uh, since traveling between countries was half restricted, my assistant at the time and me, uh, we made a step-by-step -step instru instructions using homemade videos and animations. The full version of this video is available in Mudam Luxembourg YouTube channel. The workshop activity in Mudam was running successfully until the second lockdown in Luxembourg, which was forcing the museum to close. At that point, the museum marketing department came up with a brilliant idea to offer members to pick up a free kit for home use during lockdown. All the kits offered were picked up on the first day of the campaign. Before before the summer, children were allowed back in the museum to play with the materials outdoor. Post-second wave positivity brought exciting opportunities for reproduction and implementation of the same design in different contexts. Uh, the Institute of Imagination in London, UK, opted the modular system as part of the collection celebrating New Ham's Year of the Young Person. Kids Space Children Museum in Pasadena, California chose the design to transform Robert Pavilion to 100% cardboard play and learning space. Do we have sound for this? And last but not least, the tallest construction until now, three meter high, built three weeks ago, in the large cloister of Basilica of Santa Maria Novella in Florence, Italy, under the umbrella of Firenze del Bambini. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and don't hesitate to contact with me for additional information. Thank you very much, Noah. And now I'd like to welcome UC Carlos from Hureka, Finland. Hello, everybody. I'm glad to present uh, Hureka's latest interactive exhibition called Facing Disaster. And um, in these times, I think it's uh, important to point out that by disasters, we mean natural disasters. Uh, Facing Disasters is a societal exhibition. It focuses on resilience of people and communities. And natural disasters are the context or the backdrop for displaying resilience. And as we know, climate change will increase the number and intensity of extreme weather, and we have to be more prepared for that. Um, this is an exhibition for all audiences. There are no disaster simulations, no images of misery or death. I'd say the tone of the exhibition is that of hope and encouragement. And the exhibition is set in three parts that reflect the cycle of resilience, what happens before, during, and after a natural disaster. The central part of the exhibition focuses on building resilience that is uh, preparing for natural disaster. And what is the core of resilience, not technology, not technical devices and systems, it's trust. And how do we build trust? By working together with other people for the shared goal. All the interactive exhibits in the exhibition focus on building trust. These exhibits are social demonstrations and visitors get to practice their resilience skills, communication, coordination, cooperation, and then they are prepared to face the forces of nature. Uh, the forces of nature are displayed by immersive uh, video art, the forces that cause earthquakes, 
floods, storms, and wildfires. Uh, the walk-in uh, immersive spaces are created by Hungarian uh, video mapping artist Laszlo Bordos. And in these, the visitors get to experience the greatness of nature and the beauty of nature. And this artistic uh, approach uh, to natural disasters and natural forces allow visitors to reflect what it could be to be in a natural disaster, what it could be to face a natural disaster by themselves without making it an entertainment, or should I say, light entertainment. And what happens after a disaster? In this part, we give a voice to the people who have suffered or faced natural disasters. Uh, we have gathered stories from all over the world on how people survived uh, natural disasters. And these are stories on how resilience worked. And these, uh, these teddy bears are from Australia, uh, where uh, volunteers of Red Cross need them for kids uh, who have lost basically everything. They are symbols of hope. They give some trust in tough times. And this uh, area is depicted by all these artifacts that show resilience in work. And well, I could conclude this um, uh, presentation by a quotation from Rutger Bregman, which uh, is in, totally in line with the basic message of our uh, exhibition. Disasters and crises bring out the best of us, best, of, best in us. Thank you very much. And here's the um, contact information and all the tech details. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yussi. And now we have Flora Plokin from the Musée National d'Histoire Naturelle, France. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Flora Ploquin from the French National Museum of Natural History. And I'm here today to present you the exhibition The Limits of Humanity. It was presented in her Musée de l'Homme in Paris this year during seven months. And uh, it's about uh, 600 square meters. Uh, this exhibition questions the various limits of what is human and shows that for the most part uh, these are only cultural and social construction and thus profoundly changeable. So the course uh, explores six main limits, so it's divided into several parts. The first part uh, of the exhibition um, is about the border between human and animal. Uh, in particular, thanks to a large immersive audiovisual installation where visitors are plunged into the heart of a citizen debate about the animal status. Second part uh, deals with the performance of the body. Visitors can compare their morphotype with that of great spurt women and men, uh, while three videos trace the invention of groundbreaking technique in spurts. There is also a, a large installation of sneakers that represent the eye jump made by Dick Fosbury. Uh, we revolutionized um, this practice. Then uh, we explore the limit between uh, human and machine. Uh, a futuristic setting uh, plunges visitor into the imaginary world of Seaburg and into the reality of technological innovation. So the exhibition presents many connected objects, prothesis, exoskeleton, but also film extract and uh, art uh, performance. The first part question human genetics modification. Uh, visitors are now in a laboratory atmosphere and they could design their own baby a la carte with the hands on display by choosing their genetics criteria. Um, then, um, this fifth part is about uh, immortality and the human belief and practice associated with it. Um, a selection of anthropological objects are presented as well as a large magic wall. Um, that allow visitors to explore an imaginary city uh, where everything is designed to extend the human existence. A humorous video also tells us about the new trend of the mortality uh, related to transhumanism, uh, cryonics, uploading the, your, your brain on the cloud and, and so on. 
And finally, the last part uh, of the exhibition is humorously <laughs> called We're All Going to Die. Uh, it's about the collapse of uh, biodiversity. And this collapse is embodied in uh, contemporary work, bringing together natural specimens and a large uh, graphic world. Uh, world sorry. And the end of the exhibition is a lounge space where visitors uh, can comfortably sit to listen to five possible stories uh, of our future. So uh, this exhibition is permanently available for touring because it's not a turn e exhibition. We list the grant of use uh, of the world file of the exhibition in order to create an adaptation to your space um, and thematics, so you will have a tailor-made adaptation. So if you're interested, please uh, feel free to contact us. And there is also some brochure over there. Thank you so much. Very good, thank you, Flora. And now we have um, Yole Martinenghi from uh, Contemporanea Progetti in Italy. Hello, everyone. I'm Yole Martinenghi. Uh, I'm uh, responsible for international partnerships at Contemporanea Progetti. As you can assume, we are maybe from the accent, we are Italian based. We are from Florence, Italy. Um, and for over 20 years, our company has been specialized in the development and production of touring exhibitions all over the world. I'm very happy to be here today in person uh, to tell you about this new exhibition project we are developing right now, Illuminating the Night Sky, Meets Gods and Heroes of the Cosmos. In brief, the exhibition features around 60 original artifacts, which together with accurate reproductions of original scientific instruments, interactive multimedia devices and immersive rooms, retrace the origins of ancient mythology. From tales of antiquity to the association with planets and constellations, the stories of the gods, heroes and creators that inhabited the mythical realms are explored in this large-scale dynamic exhibition that juxtaposes works of art with modern interactive and spectacular set design. So the exhibition is conceived to unfold in seven sections that lead to a final educational lab with interactive and hands-on exhibits. It orbits around two central spaces, one dedicated to the planets of the solar system of the cosmos known to us, the second one dedicated to the constellations of the night sky and the 12 astrological signs of the zodiac. The object list includes original Greek and Roman marble and bronze sculptors, red figure and black figure ancient vases and urns, alabaster sarcophagi and other original artifacts, as well as historical telescopes, scientific instruments of measurement, and modern interactive reproductions. The exhibition is very modular. It can also be thought with reproductions of original artifacts. So, who was Jupiter, Taurus, Mercury, Mars, or Venus? Was Venus the daughter of Zeus, or was she born from the foam of the sea of the island of Cyprus? As I said, the first part is dedicated to the planets of the solar system, exploring and dramatically illustrating cosmic and astrological associations between ancient mythology and the planets and stars of our solar system. A real immersion into the realms of Greek and Roman mythology, where evocative graphic panels, charts of mythical timelines, and genealogy provide background context to the intricate hierarchy of the mythical world inhabited by capricious gods and mortal men. What is then the relationship between the 12 constellations of the Zodiac and the 12 labors of Hercules, the ultimate hero of Greek mythology? Like the planets that govern them, each constellation is rich in classical mythology, and each can also be connected to the feats of the super action hero of all time, Hercules. The myths are represented by ancient works of art and objects, suggestive dioramas and interpretive graphic panels that reveal the mythical stories embodied in the stars. Ancient astrology is then mixed with modern astronomy. Finally, the exhibition concludes with a historical exploration of ancient and more modern discovery, an exploration that leads to the belief and conceptions that evolved over the course of centuries by scientists and philosophers alike, from the Roman mathematician Ptolemy to Galileo Galilei, from Isaac Newton to Margherita Hack and Samantha Cristoforetti, the first European woman in command of the International Space Station. 
the exhibition of booths, original instruments, and their replicas, charts, illustrations, and other devices provides an evocative panorama, suggesting that our fascination today with mythology is as deep and profound as the ancients, a reflection perhaps of man's constant and relentless attraction to the stars and moons that illuminate the night sky. Thank you so much. Uh, the exhibition covers from 300 to 600 square meters. It's always modular, flexible, can always be adapted. And it's available as of 2023. So if you're interested, let's have a chat. I don't have a booth, but you will find me around. Thank you so much. Thank you, very good. Okay, next we have uh, Ot Sarapu from uh, Mota U in uh, Estonia. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Good afternoon. My name is Oit, and I come from Estonia, Estland. Uh, the exhibition I'm going to talk about is The Vikings Before Vikings. And the story begins um, about um, 1,300 years ago, when a bloody battle, battle took place in Saarema, which is the uh, biggest island uh, in Estonia. And Scandinavian warriors were defeated and buried. Um, in the seashore um, into two ships. The site was uh, discovered in 2008 and it revealed a lot of um, artifacts, swords, rivets, um, pieces of games, um, human bodies, um, and the excavations and research that was carried out afterwards showed that um, the findings date back to the year 700, 700 50. So the uh, burial site is the oldest burial site of Viking warband uh, in the world and the only where the fighters are placed together in the ship. The exhibition itself looks back the lives of Viking wa wa warriors, uh, who they were, um, what type of ships they used, um, what sort of equipment they used, how they um, fights um, and of course how they were buried afterwards. Um, the exhibition size is about uh, 100 square meters so compared to the previous examples it's uh, much more smaller. It consists of modular um, walls so it can be very easily adapted um, and here are some of the pictures uh, of this exhibition. Um, the atmosphere of the exhibition is pretty dark, it's lighting up um, it has, as I said, um, almost 100 original artifacts that are displayed um, and the illustrations are there to uh, explain the original function or the shape of the um, uh, artifacts. Uh, there are two ship models. Um, there is a lot of multimedia available. Uh, so there is a about four minute film uh, which re uh, re uh, which reconstruct the, uh, uh, the battle. Um, it's kind of a bloody one. Um, and also uh, explains the, um, the different artifacts in an in a interesting way. Um, it has some uh, hands-on, uh, the rowing simulator, uh, which has proven uh, a, uh, the best, uh, including uh, or among the fathers, uh, which always are the first before the children. Uh, some small um, uh, games and a cross-section of the Viking ship uh, to resemble the, the, um, how the um, burial site uh, looked when it was discovered in 2008. Um, <clears throat> so once again, the very important information that the uh, size is about 100 uh, square meters. Um, it's a lot artifacts from the, uh, uh, from the year 700, 750. Um, Hands-on um, Exhibits, texts available in English, plus whatever languages is needed. Uh, the exhibition is available si starting from 2024 because it's pre-booked uh, until that. There are catalog available, there are Viking theme products available. And it was chosen, as you understood, it's, it's a ready uh, exhibition. It's on the display and it was chosen as the best emperor exhibition in 2021 in Estonia. And I was listening to the previous speakers and I was like uh, thinking like why you should take the exhibition. And then I thought that the best answer is that if the Netflix has done all the promotion uh, with its series, why not? Um, 
So uh, here are my contact details. Actually, we are representing here the museum that uh, did the exhibition. We are exhibition designers and uh, producers, so we did the exhibition design and production. Um, and um, a good news is that uh, we are not far from the happy hour. Uh, so the happy hour takes place in a couple of hours. We have a booth, number 60, so you are most welcome. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ud. Um, and now we have Corinne, uh, Corinne Michelet Bungo from Universions. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Corinne from Universios, as Lazy said. I would like to present you today our new exhibition, which is called Banquet. Banquet exhibition is a treat for all senses. Imagine yourself experiencing food and feasting through sight, smell, taste, touch, and sound. With Banquet exhibition, we invite every visitor to a great banquet, starting with a journey from the kitchen to a table, where science and gastronomy blend as one. Okay, so as you can see, the, the exhibition is um, divided in three parts. It is on uh, 400 to 600 square meters. It is available in three languages for the moment, French, English, Spanish, but we can adapt. Um, the, the exhibition, as you, as you know, is, uh, now is the, about the science of gastronomy, and it is uh, from uh, nine years old. So where does the experience begin? In the kitchen, of course. In this space, part kitchen, part laboratory, the visitors will become promising cooks as they go back to the basics techniques, utensils, cooking, plate presentation, recipes. They will learn food preparation techniques, discover scientific knowledge, and recipes ideas, but also the well-kept secrets from prestigious chefs. Banquet uh, arouses curiosity about scientific subjects, such as the phenomena that occur when preparing food. After the kitchen, and the cooking part, it's time to taste. So taste is about 80% smell, and through a series of multisensory experiences, sometimes yummy, but sometimes yuck, you, you can discover our senses may be deceiving, but also how your senses work when you eat. And finally, comes the long-awaited moment of celebration. The visitor is now a diner guest, sitting down to experience a unique menu inv invented especially for the exhibition by Chef Thierry Marx and scientist Raphael Aumont. In an immersive show, smells combined with image ma mapping and surround sound, it creates a special atmosphere where the table comes alive, creating a dreamlike banquet for the visitors to experience. Does this exhibition has made you angry? I hope so. So come and visit us at booth 52 because the experience continues. Of course, um, our portfolio beside the banquet exhibition, we have all other touring exhibitions. So if you have more questions, so please don't hesitate to drop by the, our booth. We'll please with my colleagues to uh, answer all your questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Corinne. And now we have Céline Nadal from Museo Science in France. Hi. So um, my name is Céline Nadal. I have a PhD in theoretical physics, and I am also a curator. I've worked as a curator in a science museum in France for several years. And then I have founded my own independent structure, it's Museo Science, to promote science and technology through the creation of exhibitions mixing science and art. 
And I have worked on several projects for different museums and so on. But I also have my own projects. And I'm very pleased today to present my first traveling exhibition. It's about colors. So let's start with a game. So let's focus on the two circles. Circle on the left, circle on the right. OK, you see, the circle on the right is a bit darker. Uh, the, the colors are different. Who agrees with this? Please raise your hand if you agree. OK, you know what I'm going to say. They look different, but it's the same color. Because it's an effect of the interaction between colors. It's actually the different background. OK, so does an object have a definite color? Or is color just an illusion? Do we all see the same colors? Do animals see the same colors as us? Do people from different times, different societies, see the same colors? Um, so physics, optics, they can explain a lot about the color vision, of course. But they are not able to describe precisely what we see and what we feel in the matter of color because there is much more to it than that. And this is what I want to show uh, with the color exhibition. Uh, I want to invite the public to dive into the world of color, to be surprised, to, uh, to be surprised to question what we see, to question our prejudices in the matter of color. OK, so about the exhibition. There are a lot of uh, interactive displays, like uh, fun, hands-on, educational experiments, appealing to sight, of course, but also to other senses, such as uh, touch, hearing, or smell. For example, you can experiment the effect of light and lighting, the effect of mixing of the colors, the interaction between colors, the symbolics, and so on. The exhibition, you will navigate between science, nature, and culture through different kinds of displays, like exhibits, but also experiences, animation movies. And finally, the exhibition offers a poetic approach through art. So there are um, original contemporary artistic creations, such as the uh, color chart dress. It's a dress with several nuances of green. The exhibition is uh, designed for travel and it's also eco-designed because it was important for me uh, to take into account the environmental impact from the beginning. And to conclude, so it's an art and science traveling exhibition. It's uh, adaptable from 150 to 300 square meters. It's for families with children from six. It's also for adults. And it's available from March 2023. So don't hesitate to contact me. And thank you very much. Thank you, Celine. And now we will have a video from Maria Piacente from the Royal Ontario Museum in Canada. Bloodsuckers from Legions to Legends is the award-winning transdisciplinary exhibition created by the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Canada. Leeches, moths, flies, fishes, bats, birds, and more have evolved to take advantage of blood, an abundant and life-giving resource. How they do this is intricate, diverse, and frankly, quite impressive. Blood-feeding animals are vital to the health of our ecosystems. And yet the fear of creatures who drink our blood has spawned belief in the undead around the world, be they chilling or charming. But blood feeders have inspired us too, from medical treatments to storytelling. We have relied on blood sucking animals for millennia. This exhibition is immersive, interactive and fun, exploring topics that include evolution and diversity, popular culture and medicine, to name a few. Objects and live specimens are accompanied by larger-than-life models of blood feeders. 
Stunning and detailed displays allow for up-close encounters with taxidermied specimens. An oversized blood cell model is both a photo opportunity and an interactive experience to understand this key resource for blood feeders. The exhibition includes displays of an array of creative expressions of blood feeders in popular culture, including this vampire retro theater. 19th century bloodletting equipment tell a story about medical innovation that continues to the present day. This unique exhibition has more than 100 objects, wet, mounted, taxidermied, objects of historical significance and popular culture, digital, audiovisual and mechanical interactives will delight visitors along with the many larger than life models and immersive environments. Contact the ROM to bring this exhibition to your institution in 2025 and beyond. And don't forget to check out ROM's website or contact us directly for other amazing traveling exhibition opportunities like the natural history show Blue Whale and the contemporary art experience being legendary. Right, that, thank you um, for that. And now we will have um, Gwenaëlle Allen from Sensory Odyssey uh, in France. Good afternoon, everybody. Sensory Odyssey. So I am Gwenaëlle Allen, founder, creator of the uh, Sensory Odyssey. Uh, great to be part of the Excite family. So we are basically in the, in the midst of creating a new edutainment brand, uh, basically staging natural history exhibitions, but for new generations. We are producing original sensory walkthrough spectacles that are designed to generate through all our senses and through scent, a feeling of belonging, a feeling of resonance, with nature, but also to reach out and touch larger, larger and, more, and universal audiences that may not have had a, spe a special interest in natural sciences and or the environment before. Uh, we just opened our first iteration in co-production with the Natural History Museum in Paris uh, in, November, in October 21, where we made a very strong first impression having sold over 210,000 tickets since then, and nearly sold out every day, which is, a telling, uh, which is telling for a project in its experimental phase, and still quite unique in its genre in the edutainment industry. As you can see from a vast amount of extraordinary quotes we've had from the, in the French press. Um, imagine Alice in Wonderland, in the land of Darwin, Visitors, like explorers, walk across eight spaces, 360-degree giant cinematic installations to immerse themselves in the secret world of living species, endowed with super sensory powers to see, to hear, to smell, to feel the world like never before, through original content, hyper-realistic and proprietary sounds, scents, images filmed all across the planet. The experience, oh sorry, the experience is totally wordless to allow the sensations to take over in visitors' experience, especially the power of scent. Of all our senses, the sense of smell is the most powerful trigger of emotions and memory. A time and space travel machine a universal language shared by a multitude of species. Now, in this first iteration, explorers will walk through from the equator to the poles, embark on a one-hour journey which begins in the midst of the flamingos taking off in Kenya, landing in the dark savanna at night where other animals gather around the pond to hear and to smell, they then flow down from the top of the French Guiana rainforest, experience echolocation with flying bats, are then absorbed into the deep earth underground life, are shrunk into insect size to perceive pollination at a macro scale, 
and then immersed into the deep blue ocean and across, below, above polar landscapes. This co-production with the Natural History Museum of Paris allowed us to develop also a post-show experience to help people understand what they've just discovered and take positive action. We are now preparing the next phase of imaginative and bio-inspired staging design ideas to with lighting and props, and about to set out on an international touring, a very ambitious international touring, simultaneously across the planet in the spring of 2023. Responsible, adaptable, upgradable, educational, and uplifting entertainment. Every unit is modular, scalable, with limited freight needs. More importantly, we can uh, we can substantially customize the visit experience to best suit each venue, audience, and co-conceive with the um, venues locally. At the core of our mission, cognitive sciences and wellness to trigger all. The state of mind allows the public to be more receptive, to, to raise awareness, to deeply raise awareness and biodiversity, and induce a bottom-up urgency to become engaged citizens with a so stronger sense of care. So can you make a sensory odyssey in your city uh, starting 2023? Please feel free to call upon me when you, are, uh, when you see me at the end of, uh, at the, end of the day. Uh, I'd, be, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronel. And now our final speaker is Jan Pomierny from uh, Stella Fireworks in Poland. Welcome. So the next is in the slide. Two of us. Yeah, here, together. Hi, hello. Thank you for having us. Actually, the two of us, uh, Katarzyna Świętochowska, Chief Development Officer of our studios, Science Now and Stella Fireworks. And I'm Jan Hello. Pomierny, CEO and founder of Studios. So uh, in our work, we combine strategic design with focus for science and culture and engagement with what we can get uh, from our second pillar, I would say, which is entertainment and attractions. And as you can see, we are a member of Excite, but also of International Association of uh, Amusement Parks and Attractions and Theme Entertainment Association. And we're trying to combine what is the best from both worlds. They are not that far from each other. And we actually learn about many cases about that during the conference. Uh, and they can, of course, benefit from each other a lot. Yep. So just to give you a brief of what we're doing, it's actually interdisciplinary and tailor-made formats. Because we believe that there is, uh, as Jan said, there is a lot of uh, from different, there is a lot of to gain from very different approaches and diff linking different uh, categories, linking different worlds. So we were responsible for creating the exhibition of the Polish Pavilion at Expo. Uh, and it was uh, one. I mean, one of the, our, our latest uh, project. But we also did shows, uh, for example, a multimedia show uh, on water with theater and dancers. Yeah, and of course, uh, traveling and permanent exhibitions. And one of them is Above and Beyond, which we develop and produce with our friends from International Astomical Union for 100 years anniversary of the International Astomical Union. And actually, this one is also still available for touring. So if you would be interested to have it, to host it, uh, please contact IIU for that. And this one is also available in open source format. So you can also actually use this uh, every designs and files and content files. We, we made them available online so you can develop also your language version exhibition. And that exhibition was in many countries around the world. Before we go to the main pitch, uh, we just wanted to let you know that we're working right now on an exhibition about Copernicus. And we're at the very early stage, so looking for partners, collaborators, uh, co-producers. So if you feel this is something you would like to uh, collaborate on, please get in touch. We're exploring two for formats of the experience. So one will be uh, an, immersive, uh, an immersive exhibition. The other one will be like a more classical traveling one. Yes, and now we'll actually get to an exhibition which we want to present in details. And that's the uh, actual title of our presentation today. This one is about uh, Polish researcher, famous Polish researcher and traveler, Wacław Severin-Drzewowski. 
So don't get misled. It's not like a um, biographical uh, exhibition. It's a rather a story about exploration, about uh, courage, about finding another culture and finding links between two seemingly very different cultures. Because Zhivuski was primarily um, commissioned to find Arabian horses and bring them to Europe, but he soon realized that the culture there is so interesting that he wants to dig into that and get to know the Bedouins living um, on the desert um, and we're running out of time. So I'm just gonna tell you that uh, this is a story w based on his manuscript where he, uh, where he depicted basically everything that happened on the Arabian Peninsula. We know really, really a lot about that culture. And this is the exhibition we presented it, uh, in Dubai for the first time. It was its premiere. It's actually available uh, from now on. And uh, we wanted to give it like a more uh, pop culture flavor. And this is the comic book that we also created um, to, to give like a, another dimension to the project. And if you want to have some fun and do some sort of games uh, connected to the subject, please visit the website, the Emir from Poland. From there, you can download um, free, for, uh, free materials uh, to explore at home with children, with, uh, with your families and friends. Yeah, and this is also available as open source uh, package. You can actually translate it quite easily, and you can actually print some things not only in 2D, but there are also 3D printing files available for even more fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for attending, and thank you all the um, speakers for presenting a really wide range of uh, interesting exhibitions. And just one last thank you also to Teo and Museum's partner for supporting us with this showcase, and Victor and his team of technicians who've helped it all run really smoothly. Um, there will be a recording on YouTube if you haven't managed to catch all the details. So thank you very much, and I think the AGM will be happening in this room uh, next. Enjoy the rest of the conference.
Ähm, da ich nicht genau weiß, was kommt, ist die 5 und die 6 jetzt auf den Tischen auf den zwei. Eins links, eins rechts. Und die 7 ist auf dem Rednerpulttisch. Wie auch immer das Holzklötzle heißt. Genau. Äh, Headset 1 müsstest du haben, der ist ja schon verkabelt. Ich meine, der spricht im Moment gerade nicht und ich glaube, der Herr Maikwart kommt jetzt dann auch gerade. So, das wäre dieser Herr Bernd, nee, Mike war oder sowas von gestern mit dem Bart und dem weit nach außen gestellten Mikrofon. Viel Spaß. Das hatte, der hat das Headset 2.